Welcome back. Thursday, June 1st marked the beginning of Pride Month with celebrations of LGBTQ Wisconsinites. Governor Tony Evers marked the occasion raising the pride flag over the east wing of the state capitol. Raising the pride flag today sends a message for all those who've only ever wanted to belong, who've had to find their own family, who've never known home. You belong here. Inside the building, members of the state legislature's bipartisan LGBTQ caucus are planning on introducing a package of equality legislation. That includes repealing Wisconsin's ban on gay marriage, which was included in the state's constitution in 2006. The only way to repeal it is for the state legislature uh, to put a repeal on the ballot and give voters the opportunity to take that language out of our state constitution. And that's taken on new importance because of the Supreme Court ruling in Dobbs on abortion last year, where some of the uh, justices in the majority there hinted that they also wanted to overrule marriage equality. That's among a series of LGBTQ issues at the state capitol right now. Earlier this year, the Republican-controlled legislature blocked the Democratic governor from banning conversion therapy in Wisconsin. We spoke earlier this week with the co-chair of the Congressional Equality Caucus, Wisconsin Congressman Mark Pocan. We caught him on the heels of the vote to raise the country's debt ceiling and started by asking him about his no vote. So this was not so much a, a vote against compromise because uh, we've been saying for months that, you know, we should lift the debt ceiling. In fact, we shouldn't even have a vote to deal with this. That's a whole other conversation we should have uh, at some point. But the problem is a lot of the information wasn't forthcoming. Uh, we didn't know what uh, COVID rescissions were going to happen to the state of Wisconsin. Um, we couldn't see the side agreements, and much of it was in side agreements. In fact, $58 billion of funding for seniors and schools and health care and things like that uh, were not actually in the bill. It was a much lower spending bill, but the side agreements have those, but we couldn't read the side agreements either. Um, all of that going into a vote. Um, you know, just left a number of us, especially those of us on the Appropriations Committee and the Budget Committee. In fact, the ranking members of both of those committees voted against it for those reasons. Um, you know, we have the responsibility of spending uh, the government's money, uh, but if the details aren't there, it's really hard for us to look at that the closest to be able to proceed. Um, and I want to ask you too, obviously, when we were speaking earlier um, last month, earlier in May, uh, you're talking about how reckless it was to kind of mess with the debt ceiling, um, but on its face, you voted against raising the debt ceiling last night. Um, if you want to explain that vote at all. Yeah, we, we shouldn't have been in the place to have to do this. Uh, we've uh, lifted it something like 80 some times in our history, um, three times under President Trump without any fanfare. Uh, we didn't have to go through this uh, struggle and negotiation in order to do uh, what should be our responsibility. In fact, prior to uh, when I got to Congress, just before I got there, if you voted to spend the money, uh, you automatically lifted the debt ceiling. You didn't have a separate vote for a number of years. The fact that we have this uh, allows some people to just be able to create havoc in the system. And that's what happened. So out of it, we got this uh, unfortunate um, process that led us to a lot of questions about how we're going to be proceeding financially. So, you know, I, I was there for sure to lift the debt ceiling uh, because it's a no brainer. Uh, but the vote yesterday wasn't just doing that. The vote, unfortunately, um, was about a lot of cuts to things that people care about in Wisconsin, uh, as well as some other concerns about things that got added that had nothing to do with financial matters, but got thrown into a package that I think ultimately we're going to find more out down the road. And I don't think uh, the vote's going to sit well for a lot of people. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit. We're recording this uh, Thursday morning, the first day of Pride Month. Um, this also marks the first Pride Month since last November, uh, where we now see divided control of government federally. I'm just kind of curious how that plays out in Congress there. So I think what we're seeing the most, there was an article in the New York Times a couple months ago about uh, folks uh, within the conservative political infrastructure throwing literally spaghetti on the wall to find out what's that next issue that they can give as red meat to the Republican base that's a socially conservative. And they found when they were throwing the spaghetti that uh, the issue of transgender uh, really had some resonance because most people don't know someone who's transgender, or at least they don't think they know someone who's transgender. And because of that, they can still breed fear and hate around that. So 
That's exactly what we've seen. I think almost 600 pieces of legislation in state legislatures around the country and Congress, uh, bills to ban trans girls from playing in sports to uh, affect the type of medical care they get, the decisions that their parents or doctors are making, governments trying to step in. Um, we're seeing a lot of legislation like that. And the unfortunate nature is it has a real impact. You know, This is politicians building their brand on these sorts of issues and bluntly fundraising off of these issues, punching down at kids who just want to play sports with their friends. And uh, we've had a lot of those fights in Congress, and I'm expecting that for probably the next year or so, uh, we'll have those. The good news, though, uh, is uh, like we saw with marriage equality. I remember when every state was passing a law saying marriage is between a man or woman, and now 70 plus percent of the people understand there's no threat to their marriage. And if there is, they've got some other issues uh, over this. Uh, I think the same will happen uh, with the issue of folks who are transgender. Once you get to know someone and realize that a lot of this has just been fear that's been stoked uh, in order to make people do certain things, generally to vote a certain way, uh, I think we'll come out of it better. But it's a tough period right now uh, for, for folks who are trans, especially kids. And quite honestly, there's a lot of bleed over into the uh, gay and lesbian community as well that uh, is gonna also have to be felt for a little while. Uh, so here in Wisconsin, um, we see a little bit of a push-pull dynamic. Um, I think you could describe it as a little bit Dems uh, kind of pushing under a GOP-controlled legislature here uh, for some of these protections uh, where Republicans, obviously in the majority, are pushing for a little bit of more individual and local kind of control and discretion. We saw that play out here with a conversion therapy ban, uh, for example. In Congress, obviously now that Democrats are uh, the minority party in the House, uh, what can you kind of advocate for? What can you push for from that position? My job is to really make sure that we're getting the truth out there. You know, meet a trans uh, child, meet the parents of a trans child and talk to them what it's like for their daily existence, their kids getting bullied when politicians, quite honestly, are the only ones who are raising these issues. Um, you know, that's, I think, what we're doing right now. Maybe it's a bit defensive, but I think we're also putting out some really positive messages that hopefully will have long-term effects once we get out of this, you know, relatively dark period.